unless you know really the deep nature of the uh, you know the material that you're studying. But just for that reason, they do give you information on the material that you're studying that, that you couldn't have got from these universal numbers. So if you know the speed of sound and if you know the viscosity, then you can work out in rough order of magnitude what is the size of an atom. That's a very interesting thing to know. So that, that's that's the point of view I'm taking. In fact, a, maybe I'll tell later if someone's interested. There's a nice way of saying this where you can measure the size of an atom by striking a match. That, uh, that was Daniel Sardarsky's way of expressing this. If someone reminds me of something like that, so. So, uh, so we've got this so implicit. Yeah. So, but if you, you have the diagonalization problem that you're talking about, that will ultimately only determine C by M squared. Right? The, the diagonalization problem that you're talking about will only determine C by L squared. Well, the, the diagonal, no. Um, because it's, a, it's ultimately a, coming to, it's a standard quantum field theory diagonalization problem, isn't it? It is, but the it, as I said, if you, don't, if you don't have the cutoff at all, you'll get an infinite answer, this diagonalization problem. Yes. So it's not well defined in the absence of the cutoff. Right. Yeah. That's the key thing. So if so, you want... So, I mean, so some, some sort of ultraviolet information is necessary for f formulating in the way that you're saying it, is what I'm saying. I mean, like if you, if you just formulate in quantum field theory, this is essentially all we can say. If you just formulate quantum field theory and, and say we take it seriously down to the arbitrarily small length scales, then you will compute. This will all make sense, but you'll get a divert. This sum will diverge, and you'll get an infinite answer. So if you think that the entangled entropy should be finite, then then why should you think that? Well, because it's relation to black holes or something like that. If you think it should be finite, then um, there has to be a cutoff. I think that energy is uh, very much like what you said just now. That uh, hydrodynamics versus kinetic theory. Like the kinetic theory forms the underlying basis for hydrodynamics. You get explicit expressions for viscosities and other transfer equations. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The difference is, we, in, in the case of quantum gravity, we don't know the no, no. underlying theory yet. Yeah. But this can, but if and when we do know it, and it turns out to be discrete, this can give us. Um, Important is you mentioned about that. If you, you form it in terms of quantum field theory, yeah. you do need a cutoff. I mean, in the sense that, like, if quantum field theory is formulated with a cutoff, and that you will need that, and uh, somehow you need an extra physics input to solve it, it seems to me. Well, this is. Th so far, I'm just doing a free field. So most people would argue that the free field theory itself doesn't require a cutoff. I mean, maybe, maybe if you're really careful, even the free field theory does require a cutoff. I don't want to take a position on that. Um, but, yeah, I don't know what else to say beyond that. And some, uh, oh, yeah, I wanted to, oh, I wanted to make, just recall that these days, this entanglement entropy is used a lot in connection with condensed matter. And there, of course, you do have a cut. There's a cutoff, it's like you were yeah, saying. Right. There again, we know the deeper theory, and we know what the cutoff represents, and it represents the interatomic space. But uh, the, yeah, the thing that bothers me is that somehow you seem to be saying that you can use this as a bootstrap for getting information about C. That seems like a uh, talk. Oh, no, no, I'm saying we have to do the calculation to get C. So I'll set up, I'll say I want to set up the calculation. Because that'll give us the value of C. And then um, once we have C, then we can use this relationship to get information on L. So C we can compute. But it's not universal. What, what it means to say that it's not universal is that its exact value depends on how you implement the cutoff. It's in that language that people use, it's scheme dependent, you know, where scheme means renormalization scheme. In other words, the way in which you introduce the cutoff may, may influence the value of C. But once you've chosen how you will introduce the cutoff, then it's completely calculable in principle. So C is defined independent of this relation? Uh, no, C is, no, C is defined via this relation. So we're going to prove, if we complete the calculation, that S, I mean, this is an asymptotic formula. 
this is in the limit in which L is much less than L squared is much less than A or something like that, and it's not too much curvature. I mean, but in some in some appropriate situations, this is an extremely good approximation. And then, um, in, in that, in those circumstances, C is defined by this relationship. Okay, so the, 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 that'll lead to this problem, this unsolved problem, need to analyze because it's specifically find a spectrum of some sort of integral operator, which I'll just try it. I'll just write it. It's not exactly like this, but there's some sort of integral operator. And there's a the cutoff comes in here in a way. We'll see what it is. It basically involves vessel functions, these I think they're called modified vessel functions, K0 and K1. It's a convolution of those two. That's what lambda looks like. And then what's never been completed is to actually diagonalize this operator to find the spectrum of it, or to find enough about the spectrum so that you can work out the, you know, the value of this sum. I think in response to some comment by Bar, you said two days ago that uh, this doesn't work for the particles who are identical. Um, well, they're not. I, so here, yeah. So this is a, that would be a, that's right. So, but would here, we need to we're worry about that when I mean, we do here field theory? When we do field theory? Yeah, when we do field. So, so that's why I sort of hesitated. It's not that the particles are identical, but that the oscillators are identical. So when we do field theory, let's take. Uh, I have to apologize to myself, maybe no one else, but let's apologize to myself for taking a split of space time into space and time. So let's take a moment of time, which I'll call sigma, so this is some three dimensional, let's say, R3, um, just some <coughs> Cauchy service, flat, in, flat, flat space time, space in a moment of time, and think of the field as a collection of oscillators. Now in that frame, one at each point of space, right? And it's just sitting there and oscillating and influencing its neighbors and so on and so on. So this would be like a spatial cutoff, not a space-time cutoff. Uh, ultimately, I would argue that the space-time cutoff is the more appropriate oh, yeah, one. And that's, um, in fact, it's so opinion. Yeah. yeah, in fact, they're not identical particles in the sense of Fermi derived composites. That's right. So, yeah, I was going to refer to it. turns out that you can do the calculation for the, uh, at least in 1 plus 1, you can simulate the space time cutoff, and it's quite interesting. It, real, it yields results entirely consistent with the conformal field theory results. But here I'm just taking a spatial cutoff. So you're just dealing with a collection of oscillators. But each oscillator is distinguishable from every other oscillator because it represents a different point in space. So just by knowing where it is, that's extra. That's the label, if you like. So there's no need to symmetrize among the oscillations. So we so we are in fact in that situation of distinguishable oscillators. Even though the excitations of one oscillator so are not distinguishable from each other, they're the bosons. So this is where we're going. Okay, so let me start with the need for a cutoff. Give some intuitive arguments why we must have a cutoff. So let's start with the um, the Lagrangian density. Now we're doing field theory, but I'm doing it in um, well first I'll write it four-dimensional form, very familiar. Let's consider a massless field. Later on, I'll consider massless field just for simplicity. But now, for this argument, it's important to, to, to think of the field as having a mass. Um, this is this, this this is all a space-time picture. If we so so when I write grad pi, sorry, when I write grad pi squared, that's shorthand for eta mu nu grad mu pi. For this mu and mu is 0, 1, 2, 3, or whatever the space time. 
convention is. Now let's consider, and, and of course, now we're doing relativistic quantum field theory, so I'm going to set C to 1. Long ago we set H bar equal to 1, so I'm not going to bother to keep, keep either of those. Now let's go into this space and consider a very simple region, a sphere of radius r. And let's ask, what's the entanglement between the, uh, the, re the field, the scalar <coughs> field, inside this region and outside this region? Well, what can it depend on? So again, the dimensional argument. The entanglement, this entanglement entropy, maybe, I don't know what we call this region 1 and region 2. So you trace out, you take the state on this whole hyper-Cauchy surface, you trace out region 2 to compute the entropy. Or if you like, you trace out region 1 and you compute the entropy of what's left in 2. We saw before, or at least I claimed, that you get the same results either way. That's, that's always the case when you start with a global pure state. So, uh, in this case, the, uh, obviously the answer the entropy can only depend on the radius, but the radius is not dimensionless. So the only dimensionless quantity we can make is the, basically the ratio of the radius to the Compton wavelength of the particle. So it's just m times r. Okay. So the so the entropy must be a function of m times r. But now let's now. Let's consider what happens when r goes to zero. So when I make, it's, so there's, there's two possibilities. There's two possibilities. Either the entropy is infinite, which is what's going to happen, or it's finite. Let's suppose for the moment that the entropy is finite. If the entropy were finite, it's more or less obvious that if I take the sphere smaller and smaller, I'll get less and less of it. Um, and it will go to zero. So if r goes to zero, we'll apply the, imply that s goes to zero if the entropy is finite. This is just a heuristic argument. If, on the other hand, because you know, there's nothing left in the limit, there's nothing left to be entangled with. Anything. On the other hand, because it only depends on this product, taking r to zero is the same as taking m to zero. So that implies that if m goes to zero, holding r fixed, then again, the entropy disappears. But that's absurd, right? Because we've, we're holding r fixed and we're just taking the mass to be smaller and smaller. But if the mass is smaller, that only means that the coupling becomes, that the sort of correlations become longer range, not shorter range. And there's no way that the entanglement would go to zero. So it's a contradiction. So the only way out of that contradiction is that um, it's infinite all along. So yes, if you take r to zero, it gets smaller, but it's just you know it's just a smaller infinity. And if if you accept this, and you don't have to accept this because when we do the explicit calculation, you'll see that the entropy really is infinite without the cutoff. But this means we need the cutoff. So that's the, that's the first intuitive argument for the need for the cutoff. Then the question is, um, does nature actually provide one? That's what we were just talking about before. And, and then if so, crucially, is it, and how can it be Lorentz invariant? So this cutoff we're using, we're using that, that we will be using, is very much not Lorentz invariant because it's composed in a particular frame, as we'll see. But we ultimately want something that's Lorentz invariant. That's one reason I think the causal, the causal set is the only one that I know that will provide something like that. Okay, so that that's just a sort of warm up. Now let's go back and think a 
again, how we would compute entanglement that could be. But the meaning of entanglement, I should have erased it so quickly. So anyway, let's go back and see what we might expect with the entanglement entropy for this surface. Now I'll take a more general region. It doesn't have to be a sphere, but just some sort of uh, subset of the surface. I'll call it V, just some, I don't remember why, but, uh, well, because it's kind of like a ball, but it's not a sphere. And then I'll give the name, the boundary of V, uh, I'll give the name A to its area. Okay. So if we're in two plus one dimensions, it's literally an area. If we're in two plus one dimensions, it's a perimeter. If we're in one plus one dimension, it's just a, I guess it'd be one or two depending on whether you're dealing with a half, a whole half line or just a finite um, interval, a bounded interval. So now how would we expect, so now I'm going to take, yeah. so for that little, for that little hand-waving argument, I took the M mass, in order to make that argument, I had to have the mass non-zero. Now I'm going to consider for the rest of the, the discussion, zero mass, at least for the underlying field theory itself. We'll, when we come to the to the detailed calculation, we'll reduce this three-dimensional problem to a bunch of one-dimensional problems, that is one plus one, and they'll have an effective mass. But the, the actual mass I'll take always to be zero. So how would we, uh, what is entanglement actually coming from? And where's the entanglement entropy actually coming from? It's coming from the fact that there are some correlations between the values of the field inside this region B and the value of the field outside this region B. The more correlations there are, somehow the more entanglement entropy. Even in the vacuum, there are, or especially in the vacuum, there are correlations that reach across this boundary surface. So how would we guess, this is all now just heuristic, how would we guess the amount of the entanglement? So, so let's imagine expanding the field <coughs> into modes, I'll call them. They're kind of like, if you know this word, you might, if you want something, um, explicit choice of modes, you can use the so-called wavelets, but it doesn't much matter exactly which ones you use, they're just little modes that are, that are approximately localized in position and approximately localized in momentum or in wave boundary. One knows that those exist. Now, within a mode, there's no mass, so there's nothing to set a scale of the entanglement as such. So you'd expect a similar one for each mode, no matter what its absolute size is. And then, Within that mode, you can imagine that the field, the value of the field, if this mode is oscillating, then the value of the field across the whole mode is correlated. I mean, there's sort of, you know, there's sort of one number to be the value within this mode. So if it's, if it's happening to be fluctuating positively here, it'll be fluctuating positively here. So if that mode is somewhere deep inside or deep outside, this region B, it's not going to set up an entanglement. There might be correlations across the mode, but that's not an entanglement. Entanglement comes when the mode straddles the boundary. In other words, it's partly inside and partly outside. So the thing that we can sort of guess is to count, if we count the number of modes that I call straddle, I don't know if everyone knows that word, but you know, sort of you have one, and you straddle a line or something, you've got one foot on one side and one foot on the other side. So the modes that straddle the boundary of B, a good guess would be that if we count, each one of those modes contributes something on the order of one bit of correlation, and therefore one bit of the entanglement. So we could expect that we could get the amount the entanglement just by counting the number of these modes. So that's what I'm going to assume in this derivation. And remember that uh, so, I'm, so each mode, I'm going to characterize, as I said in words, each mode is going to have an approximate position x and a 
let's call it, an approximate momentum k, a wave number k, in an approximate wavelength lambda with the relation, of course, that the absolute value of k and the norm of k is just too high over lambda, the usual relation between wavelength and wave number. Don't people know that doesn't travel? Like, getting Here's one. So when I do my expansion, I mean, I guess I'm just thinking in terms of traveling waves. All traveling waves. Will... This is just at a moment of time. So it may, it may ultimately, if you wait long enough, it may cross over, or it may, it may not. It may have just. It may have followed a trajectory like this where it never comes anywhere near to me, but it could it could certainly end up coming near to me later in time. But this this uh, hand waving argument I'm doing now is just in space, it's not in time, so but the we just we just want the density matrix, we just density matrix at one moment in time. Do you think the boots to satisfy some particular classical not yeah no I mean there's no way because they're just initial data basically so if we were to worry about how they would evolve in time then the field of range would come in but now we just you know, all nodes all nodes are for that the game is uniform from an autonomic basis they're not autonomic no you you can choose them to be you can choose them to be the way of the loop does someone know about these wavelets? Yeah. More yeah. Or, yeah. I think that they, in particular, they might be orthonormal. But even if they're not, one can define orthonormal yeah. modes that are approximately localized in modes. I mean, I got wavelets with yeah. approximately local X. Where they look? Yes. But then they have tails which do not look. They do have tails, right? But they don't. They don't have an orthonormal basis. I believe they are, but I'm not 100 percent sure. And what's for sure is that if I were to use uh, coherent states, they're not orthonormal, we know that. But I think wavelets might be orthonormal. If they're not, then you can cook up things which are orthonormal. But if you go back even to Fanon's book on quantum mechanics, I think he gives a very, really explicit form of these orthonormal modes. So, that, so they're, they're... You want things localized at the boundary? And which are orthonormal to stuff outside. No, uh, no, I just want this, forget the boundary. I just want to evaluate, the, I want to expand the field in terms of these modes. Then I want to count, now put the boundary back, I want to count how many of the straddle the boundary. And that will be my estimate for the entropy. So they, they have to basically be localized in space. Yes. Yeah. And momentum space. And momentum in order to do the counting of M going to do what they need to be. They need to be quasi-localized in space and quasi-localized. And, and so therefore the counting won't work if these modes are, you know, if their wavelength is B compared to the size of B, then it becomes kind of useless. But most of the we'll see most of the modes that contribute will in fact be very without a cutoff, they'll be infinitely small compared to the size of the boundary. And as long as the cutoff is much smaller than the than the scale of this region B itself, most of the modes that are relevant will actually be um, very small compared to this great diameter of B, and so they'll have their localization will be pretty good. That's it's all hand waving anyway. Can I ask one more question? Yes. <laughs> you assume we they must you've got the back of it given your two feet. The one outside and one inside yes. the boundary. Yes. Now, if you try when x goes to y, you have a thick current expansion. I mean, this Hermann kind of But the two-point function. Yeah. But the two, you are doing the two-point function. Well, I, so uh, can I calculate? No, two, this is just a hand thing. But yeah, the two-point function is important here. That's right. Ultimately. So, <coughs> so you think that can't I calculate this number in the covariant way? You mean the entropy? Yeah. One say yes, you can. That's that's. I mean, that's what I was saying before. If you know the two point function, then in principle you can get the entropy from it. And that and the, that that formula that I referred to that other paper, which I referred to, which doesn't um, you know, it's not given any details of, 
it gives you explicitly how to get the entropy from the space-time two-part function, from the Lightman function. Yeah. yeah. But you need a cutoff. It, it's, it's always the same thing. If, if you do that, even if you, if you use that formula or any other formula, and you put no cutoff, in other words, you'll get, if, if you use that formula, you'll find the entropy as a sum over modes. You have some matrix, which is labeled by the modes, it's rows and columns, and you have to diagonalize that matrix. So if you don't put any limit on the modes, you consider arbitrarily short wavelengths, that matrix becomes an infinite matrix. If you cut off the mode at some, you know, you only a finite number of modes, it becomes a finite matrix. You can compute its entropy, and then as you take the number of modes, as you allow in more and more modes in the computation, the entropy grows and it's again <coughs> infinite. And so it's always the case that you need some sort of cutoff to get a finite answer for the entropy. Yeah, so let's ask, in value, so it's, we said these are approximately um, localized, so in the volume d cubed d of space, and in a range d cubed k in momentum space, or wave number space, how many modes are there? So this is just, um, this is really just counting cells in, um, cells in phase space, just one particle phase space, and we know the answer there. It's just d cubed p, which I've called the k, since I've, um, I've sent uh, h bar to 1, over h cubed, right? Do you remember those old formulas from so, uh, introductory quantum mechanics? But h is just 2 pi, since I said h bar to 1. So it's, so it's 2 pi cubed. So this, this is just uh, nothing to do with quantum mechanics in the end. It's just a way of counting mode, approximate mode number. So now let's take, let's look at this region again. I'll call its diameter, it's just some scale, in order of magnitude I'll call L. And now we'll consider modes of wavelength lambda. And we're into, what we want to do is count how many straddle the boundary. So let me draw a little, I can thicken the boundary a little bit. Here I always thickened it inward. But let me thicken it by an amount lambda. And so it's the modes whose center, I could have thickened it outward. In order, it doesn't make any difference in order of magnitude. It's the modes which are centered in this little shell here that's straddle on the boundary, right? If they have wavelength lambda. So we just have to count how many there are, roughly. So I'll use the notation that B is the volume of B, so it's the volume of this region. The total volume, A I've, I've already written that, A is the area of the boundary of B. And so how many modes are there in all, in all of, in all of B, how many modes are there in a, a, different, a little range of d cubed k of wave number. Well, <coughs> you just have to integrate both over the over volume, over position, and over the momentum. So the, the integrate over vo integration over volume will just give you the total volume. The integration over momentum will give you this uh, integral. Of the, will give you this integral. So, so the differential number of such modes, which can be found anywhere in the region B, with this wavelength, is this number, right? Now, how many meet, um, if you want them to meet or straddle the boundary of the region, how many are of those? Well, it's just a fraction. <coughs> it's those who find their center in, the, in this region. So the total number, the total number, would be roughly the volume of this little color neighborhood divided by the total volume. That would be the fraction. So the fraction that meets that meets that is about equal to 